Are you ready to unlock the power of God in your life? Welcome to Hightower Ministries Podcast. I'm your host, Karen Ordine, and I, along with my husband, Bill, will bring forth prophetic preaching and teaching that will unlock a deeper revelation of God's Word. So get ready for a powerful word that will raise your faith to believe God for more in your life today. Hello and welcome to Greater Glory. I'm Kara. And I'm Bill. And we're Hightower Ministries and we have been sharing a series of messages that will uh, help you to understand uh, the, the pitfalls and the snares of the enemy really tries to throw at the body of Christ. That's right. And we've been reading and sharing from Dr. Bill Hammond's new release titled Prophets, Pitfalls, and Principles. So if you desire to be used by God in the prophetic ministry, we highly recommend you that you get a copy of his new release for yourself. It'll really help you in your spiritual growth. Uh, we'll be hosting him on our Testimony Tuesday show on December the 14th. So be sure to look for that show and take it in as he pours out from his nearly 70 years of mm. prophetic wisdom. Amen. You know, we're sharing insights from his book and preaching from the word of God today as we embark on part three of avoiding of ambushments and prophetic downfalls. So far in this series, we've talked about Elijah and how he challenged 850 prophets of Baal on in the Mount Carmel showdown to prove Jehovah is the one and true only living God. That's right. He killed them all. He interceded for God's word to come to pass concerning the sending of rain, and he outran all of Ahab's horses. And in light of all these events, we find that even the great prophet Elijah was not without character flaws, nor was he immune to Satan's snares of self-pity and fear and the spirit of rejection. That's right. The warning signs that are that are seen in the stories of Elijah and Jeremiah and how the descending steps all began with disappointment. And it's plainly seen in their stories. We've been reminded that the suffering is a standard for prophetic life. And when Jeremiah uh, complained about his suffering, this is what the God, God's response was. So let's right. take a look at how he would complain about it. First. And, and we see in Jeremiah 15, uh, verses 15 through 21, Then I said, Lord, you know what's happening to me. Please step in and help me. Punish my persecutors. Please give me time. Don't let me die young. It's for your sake that I'm suffering. When I discovered your words, I devoured them. They are my joy and my heart's delight. For I bear your name, O Lord God of heaven's armies. I never joined the people in their merry feasts. I sat alone because your hand was on me. I, filled, I was filled with indignation at their sins. Why then does my suffering continue? Why is my wound so incurable? Your help seems as uncertain as a seasonal brook, like a spring that has gone dry. This is how the Lord responded to him. If you, if he said, if you return to me, I will restore you so that you can continue to serve me. <laughs> if you speak good words rather than these worthless ones, you will be my spokesperson, my spokesman. You must influence them and do not allow them to influence you. They will fight against you like an attacking army, but I will make you as secure as a fort for a, a, a like a fortified, fort, fortified, fortified wall mm -hmm. of bronze. Come on. Come on. And they will not conquer you for I am with you to protect you and rescue you. I am the Lord and I, the Lord, have spoken. Yes, I will certainly keep you safe from these wicked men, and I will rescue you from their cruel hands. Mm. Look, we, we are going to embark now on some lessons that we can learn from the lives of Abraham and Moses today. Mm -hmm. You know, Abraham endured a lot of family problems. So we're going to talk about some other prophets here. And uh, we, we were talking about Elijah, we're talking about Jeremiah, but now we're going to talk about Abraham and mm -hmm. Moses and some of their weaknesses because we can really learn from their stories. That's right. You know, Abraham endured a lot of family problems. The pro uh, prophet Abraham's greatest trials and problems came from his own family. His root problem 
and pitfall was allowing family influences to hinder him from obeying God completely in order to fulfill God's personal word to him. And we find that in Genesis chapter 12 through 25. That's right. So we encourage you to take in those the, those chapters this week. You know, keeping keeping your priorities in order is the key. We've got to we got to keep focused on what God's called us to do. And um and and how do you how do you not let your family hinder you from the ministry and and yet give honor to your family and fulfill the word? You know, we fulfill the word of God that God is telling you to do. You know, we know that it's first God, then the family, you know, second family and then ministry. Right. But, you know, what about the order of God's prophetic word when it when it interrupts with family? You know, and, and what we must understand is the difference between a prophetic, uh, you know, um, d- your directives, direction, yeah. directives mm-hmm. uh, versus uh, proper family duties and input. OK, so um, the, the bottom line is always be obedient to the word of the Lord, yeah. we, no matter what. And, and if you're obedient to the word of the Lord, you're not going to fail. Abraham's life you know, was an example of family pressure. Mm-hmm. You know, he had he had parental respect and responsibility. God first spoke to Abraham and told him to leave his country and his fam- his father's family. But his love for his family and pressure from his relatives and a sense of obligation to his parents caused him to take his family with him when he left for Ur. Of, uh, you know, of the Chaldeans, okay? Mm-hmm. So it, this this was a partial fulfillment of his personal prophecy, and, and it hindered him for a season. Yeah, it absolutely. really hindered him. You know, he refused to, to, uh, to separate from natural relationships, mm-hmm. and consequently, he, he settled down before reaching Canaan. Living in Haran, uh, you know, for several years until his father died, right. and um, and we find that in Genesis eleven, verses thirty one through chapter twelve through four, relatives wanting to relate, but you know, were they you know, they were not prophetically a part. Mm-hmm. They were wanting to relate to what God was doing with him, but he they weren't prophetically a part of what God was saying to him to do right you know so again it is it it was a a family member when you think about it it was his nephew lot Mm -hmm. whom abraham was to leave behind he was supposed to leave lot behind with his father's family okay so it was his nephew lot um that caused a split in abraham's followers after a considerable growth in in his canaan ministry and we find that in Genesis, Genesis 13, 1 through 11. Lot made his choice by what appealed to his eye and his senses rather than the word of the Lord. And relatives' reasonings will rob you of your reward. Mm, come on. You, you got to watch out for human relationships or natural relationships that God did not ordain. Mm-hmm. Be careful of those who do not have the like vision with you. You know, it's, it's supposed to be one man, you know, he was he was the one that was carrying the vision, mm-hmm. one vision holder for that ministry. Lot began to get a different vision, a natural temporal one. OK, okay. And so Lot chose what was temporal and, and natural. But Abraham chose what was eternal and of the promise, even though he could see it at That's the time. Right. That's right. And then you've got the danger of the mate making a suggestion that produces an Ishmael. Ooh, wow. Mm. So you even have to, to worry, you think about what is coming forth from your spouse. That's right. Right? That's right. Abraham allowed his wife to influence his decision making by suggesting he take Hagar, you know, her Egyptian handmaiden, as a surrogate mother to produce the promised seed. And we find that in Genesis 16. So beware of preconceived ideas which cause you to force your prophetic word to be fulfilled. That's right. And also realize that Abraham had received no prophecies which included Sarah. So therefore, he reasoned that it was a good suggestion. So we go. Uh, along quickly with what appeals to us. 
Hagar appealed to his flesh. And note, when God says to do something, try don't try to jump out and make it happen. It's always hard to cast out an Ishmael. Abraham took a long time to pray about getting rid of what cost him much. And remember, like Abraham, the Lord will allow you to birth an Ishmael, nurture it for 14 years, and be blessed from it. And then have you get rid of it in the long run anyway. Mm -hmm. Come on. When he says cast it out, you must be obedient. And we see that in Genesis 21 too. Yeah. So God esteems husband and wife teams and family ministry. Come on. Though the Bible tells us how Abraham allowed his family to influence him wrongly, it never records that God rebuked Abraham specifically for allowing his relatives to hinder the fulfillment of his personal prophecies in that way. This shows uh, God's high priority on family and relationships. Um, before acting upon the prophetic word that hinders family and relationships, wisdom would be to maybe seek direct, a direct word from God through prayer. Amen. Receive pastoral confirmation or seek counsel from trusted peers, right? That's right. Amen. And all these things cause delays in our yeah. prophetic word, and sometimes it can even cause you to only have a partial fulfillment. That's right. So you got it is requiring full obedience. OK, so in, in the next thing that we have to watch out for is spoiled children's syndrome mm. and the uh, entitlement issues of, of the spoiled children. Um, an, another family problem can be found in the story of the Israelite uh, priest Eli and his two sons, um, Hophni and Phineas in uh, uh, 1 Samuel 2. You know, it's common among ministry children, those PKs, those preacher's kids, but, you know, but can occur in, in any family, really. Yeah, right. um, and, it, and it calls, it's caused by overindulgence, um, not putting any responsibility on your children, uh, you know, and, and, and just oh, get, giving them everything that they need all the time. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. Um, it, you know, and, and that type of thing towards, you know, from parents to children is not really good if you're not bringing forth correction in, right. in real training. Eli's sons were, were wicked men. They had no regard for the Lord. Yeah. In 1 Samuel 2, 12 in the NIV, you know, they, they abused their, their positions as ordained ministers and their sin was very great in the eyes of the Lord. And we see that in 1 Samuel 2, 17. Um, Eli failed to discipline his sons when they were in sin. And rather, he chose to look the other way. And God rebuked Eli through a prophet asking, why do you honor your sons more than me? First Samuel 2, 29 is where we find that when Eli failed to correct his sons, which was his fatherly responsibility, right. or it could be a single mother's responsibility to correct yeah. uh, your children uh, in a duty. Um, he was putting them ahead of God. Mm. And when God is telling you to do something and, and do it the right way, you've got to do it God's way. That's right. And the, re, and the end result was judgment upon his whole household. Mm. All it, it, it says in 1 Samuel 2, 33, all of your household will die in the prime of life. Wow. It, it brought a curse upon them. Come on. So true fathers discipline their children amen amen and we see in hebrews chapter 12 verses 5 through 9 the word says and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children my son despise not thou chastening of the lord nor faint when thou art rebuked of him for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourges every son who he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth? But if ye be without chaste, uh, chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which have corrected us, and we gave them reverence. 
shall we not much rather be in subjection unto fa- um, unto the Father of spirits and live? Come on! Wow! It's so so it's very serious. Absolutely. And and you know that's family. That's family matters. And mm-hmm. and if you're a single mom, then you're you're a, you're taking up that both roles there. That's right. And it is on it it's on your shoulders before the Lord. That's right. Amen. So we we need mentors. Yes, we need mentors. Let's talk about that for a moment. Who model by proper methods. You know, note that the prophet Samuel, who was uh, was mentored in his ministry by Eli, um, evidently repeated some of his child rearing practices. That's right. When Samuel grew old, his own two sons were appointed as judges. And we see in 1 Samuel 8, but his sons did not walk in his ways, Mm -hmm. right? The scripture says they turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. You know, most most model our mentors. You know, most people do model their mentors. You know, in these biblical events illustrate that ministers typically take on the principles and the practices of their mentors. And it works both positively and negatively so we must even look at our mentors behaviors through the lens of the word come on and do not do the negative yes do not do the things that that they're doing in weakness that are wrong and are contrary to the word of god right we've got to be able to protect ourselves Mm -hmm. and don't just haphazardly just follow the leader Mm -hmm. we've got to follow the leader and uh, and make sure that our lives Line up with the word and God's righteousness and his holiness. Amen. Amen. You know, and there's some neg- negative examples in the word of, you know, of, of people that had uh, followed their mentors in a negative way. And we see that an Eli modeled the, you know, the spoiled children syndrome for Samuel. And David modeled sexual excess for his son, Solomon. That's right. That's and right. Then a positive example is Abraham. You know, Abraham was one of, you know, one of the reasons that God declared continual blessings on his descendants was because of this. It says, for I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him genesis 18 19 amen we have paul to timothy the paul mentored young timothy into a successful ministry that's right and elijah mentored elisha elijah submitted to the mentoring of elijah and received a double portion and jesus mentored by his heavenly father Mm -hmm. his life was it was it was the proper example for all of us for mentoring amen that's right and following and following our mentor so now we're going to get into something else. There is what we call pitfall of ministerial mates and spiritual spouses. Very important. So the first thing that we see here, I, I, I want to give the definition of a spiritual spouse or ministerial mate. So what is this? It's anyone that a married Christian person allows to become a closer companion than his or her true spouse, especially when that person is of the opposite sex. In ministry, it is usually an associate minister, a secretary, a worship or youth leader. And likewise, in business, it can be an associate, a secretary, or so on. So this is not just in ministry, but also in business. In business world, happen. too. That's right. You, you need to guard yourself. You Absolutely. really got to guard your marriage. Yeah. You know, and, and sometimes it's a gradual process of deceptive bonding. Mm. You know, situations don't happen overnight. Sometimes it's a gradual thing that Satan sets up a snare. Uh, and, and so they, they fall into a pit of deception. That's right. By sub, you know, subtly, it's yeah. just like really subtle. That's right. So people work together closely for months and years until a soul tie develops that is a close emotional bonding, right? And eventually the person's spouse ceases to be his or her closest friend or counselor or sounding board, right? Or co-laborer in business or ministry. Yeah, and then these things should not be. No. And this is something that uh, we really need to be guarded about and uh, and make sure that if we see it, 
that is called out on the carpet on. Uh, because things need to be, especially in ministry, needs to be holy, but in every marriage. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the result of this, you know, this uh, distancing that happens is that the person begins to spend more time with the associate at the office or the out of town conferences with that, you know, with that other person than their own spouse that's at home. Mm -hmm. And as the, the deception takes root within the person, he or she takes further action by manipulating their spouse out of the active involvement in ministry mm -hmm. or their active involvement in the business or the church or the church business, yeah. you know, and, and um, uh, occupying this is, it is an, is really an alienation and it affects within the marriage. It really, it really affects the marriage in a really negative way. And it could ultimately lead into a complete separation. Mm. The alienation of the spouse is justified in that person's mind because the enemy is, is twisting things and, 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 ca and causing them to believe deception. Um, you know, and so what they do is they, they alienate their spouse and it's justified by claiming that the, the ministerial mate or their, their, uh, their work, partner um it, it often understands uh, or appreciates them more than their spouse and that's what the enemy does is he brings those lies and that that mate seems patient you know that that one that's outside the marriage seems patient kind and sweet and trusting and and while the spouse appears to be a, a fussy and in and, and demanding you know always questioning the that you know the mate so th these things are are um very and very important and uh very startling but uh it, it does happen absolutely so that leads us to breaking the bond of deception that's right sin and lust are deceitful and they blind a person to reality and the end result of a ministerial mate or spiritual spouse is an adulterous affair that destroys the marriage. That's right. So what should you do if you find yourself in that type of situation in ministry or in business? And and, and what we would say was, you know, take immediate action. Absolutely. Take immediate action. Yeah. Step one, you know, if, if a minister or a business person's spouse senses such a situation developing, they need to bring it to the attention of their spouse. Mm -hmm. If their spouse responds with under, you know, with understanding, then they should begin to adjust the situation immediately. And it starts, it starts to be taken care of. That's right. And on the other hand, if uh, the, the minister responds with resentment, accusing the spouse of jealousy or lack of commitment or failure to understand responsibilities then the spouse's responsibility is to go immediately to their spiritual overseer, telling all and getting them involved in the situation. That's right. Come on. We need to open rebuke versus love covers. That's right. Right. Amen. Remember, revealing this problem to a spiritual overseer does not mean someone is betraying a confidence or failing to stand by his or her spouse or even failing to cover the sin with love. That's right. In, in this case, Proverbs 27, 5, where it says, you know, open rebuke is better than secret love. You know, it, it supersedes the scripture, the, the scripture uh, principle of first Peter 4, 8, where it says love covers a multitude of sin. Mm -hmm. This 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 scripture supersedes that mm -hmm. in this situation that open rebuke is better than secret love. You know, time is of the essence in these situations yes. because the longer the spouse waits to get help, the more the situation will grow worse. That's right. You know, so six points to remember in your marriage. Are right, we're going to talk about that for just a second. Right. So the first one, your best friend should be your husband or wife. Amen. Right. Number two. Your best counselor should be your husband or wife. That's right. Right? Amen. Number three, soul ties that exceed husband-wife relationships will cause problems. That's right. Number four, shared mind plus will, purpose together, plus an emotional tie will equal trouble. Trouble. Right? That's right. The fifth one is the moment you feel a spark that is not brother or sisterly love, jerk it out of your mind and heart. That's right. Come on immediately. And the and number six is keep your priorities in order. God, spouse, 
family ministry. That is the perfect godly order. And uh, and I will add number seven is not even the appearance of evil. Come on. So you, a man should not be around a single woman without his wife present uh, if, it, if they're not, uh, you know, if, if, if they're not contracted to do a job or something like that. It, it's very important that not even the appearance of evil. Right. Amen. Right. Right. And when you're ministering, you should be ministering two by two. That's right. Amen. So now we're we're going to share concerning the life of Moses. We're going to get into Moses's uh, life a little bit and the lessons that we can learn from his weaknesses. That's right. So prophet Moses's pitfall was of overprotectiveness. Yes. Come on. Moses was a man who had to fulfill his role, not only as a father to a family, but also the role of a pastor to over three million of God's people. Mm -hmm. He carried the pastoral rod in his hand to shepherd and lead God's people from Egyptian bondage to freedom in the wilderness. And according to prophecy, he was to have taken them into the promised land. That's right. Moses had a human virtue that became a vice, a personal strength. That when taken to the extreme becomes a double weakness. Mm. You know, his human compassion and mercy uh, versus prophetic purpose and God's judgment. Mm. You know, you know, Moses had that that human side. You know, if an enemy can't keep you from having mercy and compassion for someone, then what he'll do is he'll wait. He'll wait until the situation gets just right. And he'll cause you to have too much mercy and too much compassion Mm -hmm. to push you past the time that that uh, that you should have that timeline for mercy and compassion Mm -hmm. and cause you to disobey God's word. And therefore, you're in partial obedience and you could be missing out on your prophetic promise because Mm -hmm. you disobey God out of mercy and compassion. Wow. And that's something that Moses did. Yeah. And we can really learn from his story. I think this is a very important lesson. Human compassion versus, in mercy versus prophetic purpose in God's judgment. Mm-hmm. After they blatantly worshiped that golden calf and made that calf. That's right. And God wanted to destroy them. Mm-hmm. But Moses cried out and said, please don't destroy them. Right? That's right. So Moses's root problem was being overly protective of his personal pastoral flock, um, insisted really to toward God, you know, to have um, to have grace on them, and and that that He would preserve that generation and establish that generation instead of starting fresh and starting mm-hmm. all over. So Moses's weaknesses was displayed numerous times here. That's right, and we see in Numbers fourteen twenty two and twenty three. The word says, because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tempted me now these 10 times and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers. So 10 times the children of Israel provoked God's wrath while in the wilderness. We see the first time in Exodus 14, 11 and 12. They were, they were accusing God of, of, de- of deceiving them and deliberately leading them into a trap so that the Egyptians could kill them. That's right. And in Exodus 15, verses 23 through 26, we see that they were murmuring at Mara for water. Yes, because the, the, the water was bitter and it wasn't, it wasn't cleansed, but God did a miracle. Mm-hmm. Amen. And he revealed himself as their, their physician there. That's right. In Exodus 16, 1 through 8. They were murmuring for flesh and, and uh, bread before reaching Sinai. Yep. And in Exodus 16, 19 through 22, uh, they were willful. Uh, they were in willful disobedience and leaving manna until morning. In Exodus 17, 1 through 7, they were murmuring for water in Rephidim. Mm. In Exodus 32, they were making a golden calf and quickly going back to idolatry. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and in, in Numbers 11... One through three, they were murmuring at, at Tebera. Yes. And in Numbers 11, murmuring for flesh, meat. They were complaining. That's Come what on, murmuring a lot is. A lot of, murmuring lot of going complaining on. going yep. on. <laughs> God doesn't like it when we complain against nope. him. Number nine, uh, we find in Numbers 13, 1 through uh, 25, and in Deuteronomy 1, uh, chapter 1, 20 through 25, 
uh, we find that unbelief in God and his words. And, and they were asking that spies be sent into the, the promised land as if God, as if they doubted God and that, that he was telling them the truth. That's right. And the last one, Numbers 13, 26 through 14. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, it's Numbers 13, 26 through chapter 14, 37. Deuteronomy 1, 20, 25, also rebellion at Kadesh. Rebellion is the witchcraft. That's right. When you don't, when you don't obey the Lord. Mm -hmm. So God repeatedly told Moses that this generation was full of stiff neck, self-willed saints who belong to the old order. Mm -hmm. And they had come out of Egypt, but Egypt was not out of them. Come on. Right. Come on. Yeah. And and several times God wanted to kill them off the face of the earth. They just he just wanted to take them out. Yeah. And and and, and you know he wanted to take the older generation out. Mm -hmm. But Moses argued with God and insisted that he must preserve them. So so um so what was what was the end result of of overprotectiveness for Moses? Mm. The the old murmuring Israelites finally pushed Moses beyond his patience so that he angrily struck the rock instead of speaking to it according to God's prophetic instructions. God said, speak to the rock for the water to come out. But he was so mad with the people. He was so frustrated that he didn't obey God mm -hmm. and he messed up. That's right. Okay. But what did it cost him? Mm -hmm. It cost him so much. This one act of you know, impatience and frustration and self-will and disobedience canceled that part of his personal prophecy, which said that he would go into Canaan, wow. which said that he would go to his promised land. Mm -hmm. Oh, the cost of partial disobedience, getting frustrated and doing things on your in your own way and just saying oh i know god said to do this but i'm just going to do it my own way mm -hmm. i'm just so frustrated with my situation because i just i can't seem to do it the way he wants me to do it so i'm just going to do it my way right right and bam partial disobedience partial fulfillment of prophecy yep. just like that and then the people wonder why i'm not living in my promised land why can't that happen for me god why can't i have what you said i can have come well on. are you obeying god come on are you obeying him completely? Are you sitting in partial obedience? I mean, this is a very serious thing. That's right. God, no, no king will take a, a partial surrender. That's right. He wants all of you. Amen. He wants your whole heart and he wants your complete obedience. Yeah. So here, here's the lesson learned from Moses. There's three lessons really in the biblical truths that can be learned from this incident. Our actions can cancel part of our personal prophecy. That's big. It's huge. Yeah. Just because he said it doesn't mean you're going to you're going to see the full fulfillment. We have a part to play. That's right. Some promises from God are unconditional, but others are conditional if we obey and hearken mm -hmm. diligently to the word of the Lord, the word of our God. Amen. Come on. So even after much ha has been prophesied about us and, and you know, it, it, and much has been fulfilled, our actions can cancel prophecies that remain unfulfilled. Our remaining unfulfilled prophecies will be fulfilled depending upon our continual faith. That's right. Obedience and patience. Yeah, absolutely. Second, God's grace for endurance does not extend beyond the bounds of God's purpose. Mm. So. You're empowered by his grace to do the kingdom call. Mm -hmm. But once you go past what he's asked you to do, that grace for, for anything further than that border lifts. That's right. So like Moses, when we demand that God do things our way, then we are on our own. Mm -hmm. When God says, you do this and do it now, and you say, I'm having a hard time with that. Why don't you do this and that and just make it happen? Right. No. <laughs> now you're on your own. Yeah. Because and then you're going to stay frustrated because you're trying to do it your way and not doing what God told you to do. Mm -hmm. And when you step out to do what God told you to do it and do it his way, then there's an empowerment. There's a grace for you to get it done. God might very well just give us what we want. That's scary. Yeah. You know, to our own destruction. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So some examples of that are here. 
why don't you share a little a few of those there? Israelites <laughs> grumbling about manna. They craved meat, so God sent quail. Oh, my. But even as they ate the meat, a severe plague broke out and killed many. And we see that in Numbers 11. Because they were ungrateful for the provision he had already given them. That's right. They Come on. the manna coming from heaven. That's right. And Ab they were grumping and, and complaining about it. Absolutely. And then we see King Hezekiah of Israel. When God prophetically decreed through Isaiah that he would die, the king wept bitterly and begged for an extension of life. And we see that in Isaiah 38. And in response, God granted 15 more years. He did. But in those added years, Hezekiah, beha his behavior led to a disaster in the nation. For the whole nation. For the whole nation. He and the people would have been better off if the original prophetic decrees had been, been fulfilled as it led to the death of his family and captivity for all of Israel. Mm. So when you think of the prodigal son in Luke 15, the son, you know, demands his inheritance before the proper timing. And the father allows him to waste it all and go into ruin. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. that's a prophetic picture that's when you're right. asking God to give you your full inheritance before the time. Mm -hmm. So the timing of the Lord in God's in God's perfect will is what we should be in step with and pray Amen. for. Amen. And if we don't know, we pray for wisdom. That's right. Because wisdom tells us what to do. When we don't know what to do. Yes. Apostle Paul reveals in the New Testament that those who who hate truth and um, insist on harboring falsehood get what they want in the end to their own doom. That's right. He said of them, they perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sent them a powerful delusion so that they would believe the lie and so that they all would be condemned who had not believed the truth, but had delighted in wickedness. And we see that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 10 and 11. Amen. And so we're going to talk about pastoral compassion and prophetic purpose sometimes they will be at odds with one another. Mm -hmm. Some, you know, many times this struggle will cause friction and even conflict within the local church between the pastor and the prophet. The key to maintaining unity is to see God with a whole heart. Come on. Both parties being humbly mm -hmm. open hearted to whatever God wants to do. Moses's in, in insistence and compassion uh, was commendable from a pastoral perspective, but from a prophetic perspective, his actions were foolish and futile. Remember, God still had to, to kill off almost the entire older generation to see his purposes fulfilled. Come on. Pastors today must not be overly protective. Mm. Don't insist that old wineskin saints or a whole our denomination has to come in. If so, you may die in the wilderness with them. Come on. When when prophet <laughs> shepherds are overprotective of their flocks, so mercy motivated that they will not allow God to chasten properly those under their charge, they set themselves up for the Moses pitfall. That's right. God's perfect, prophetic purpose is greater than human uh, preferences. That's right. You know, the, his purposes are greater than what we want. Mm -hmm. OK, it, it makes no difference to God what humans, uh, you know, what what man's reputation or statue is, whether they they give ten thousand dollars or or um, they're they're a you know, founding member of the church. Those in leadership must follow God's directives. Yes. We've got to we, we we can't be putting the the Ark of the Covenant on a, on an ox cart. Yeah, that's right. You know, God God wants His Levites carrying His presence. Mm. Amen. Amen. And we need to be led by the Holy Ghost. Yep. You know, they, they owe no uh, allegiance to man and should feel no obligation to the old an, an old order. Okay, a, a traditions you know, uh, uh, of, of the congregation. We we need to have our allegiance to the Lord mm -hmm. and his word and the way that God wants to do things. Because if they do, if they if they keep their allegiance to an old uh, tradition or uh, an old um, 
an old way of doing things or people that won't come out and 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 uh, be led of the Holy Ghost, then you know they will never enter into present truth or for, or fulfill their prophetic uh, potential. Come on. So so this concludes part three in this series called avoiding ambushments and prophetic downfalls. And so we want to seal this word in prayer today. You know, we want to pray for prophetic insight to see truth, to covet the gift of discerning of spirits yeah. and the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom, you know, to see truth within ourselves and our, and our current situations. We want to see complete truth for purity to come forth and, and for us to for allow the Holy Spirit to work things out. Yeah. And every one of us that we don't fall into the snares of the enemies um, or the attacks on our minds, that we are rightly dividing the word of God and that we are thinking with the mind of Christ. Amen. 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 So, Lord, Father, we just thank you right now for this time together. We thank you, Lord. Lord, Father, there everyone that is uh, joining us. And listening to this me these messages, Lord Father, we just ask you right now to touch us, Lord Father. We apply the blood of Jesus over us, Lord. Yes, Lord Father, Lord. we ask you to open our ears to hear your voice so clearly. Open our eyes to see in the spiritual realm that we would see what you are saying and conveying. Lord God, open our hearts to perceive revelation of who you are and who you created us to be. Lord Father, we covet earnestly the gift of discerning of spirits, Lord God. We covet the, the gifts of the spirit, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and in, uh, in the, the gift of prophecy, Lord God, that, that you would uh, enlighten us, Lord Father, and give us pieces of your wisdom and knowledge and understanding that we would know, Lord Father, what your will is, that we would know the things that we need to correct, Lord God, and help to make every crooked path straight in our hearts and in our spirits, Lord Father, in our minds. We bless you, Lord Father. We ask, Lord God, that you continue to open this word up and this message up all week. And we, uh, we thank you for it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, we thank you for joining us for greater glory. And uh, we hope that you've enjoyed this message. And again, if, if you would like to, uh, to know more about what we're preaching about and teaching uh, from, we've been gleaning from the pro uh, Prophets, Pitfalls, and Principles by Dr. Bill Hammond. And we'll be having him on our Testimony Tuesday show in December, on December the 14th. So yeah. uh, if, uh, if you can look that up and uh, and take that in, because you'll really enjoy uh, what he has to say. Amen. We encourage you to get in contact with us at HightowerMinistry.org. And when you go to our webpage, you'll be able to fill out a prayer request that we know how to pray for you. And you can also uh, sign up for a, a download, a free download Amen. there. Yes. Amen. And uh, so if you subscribe and, and get that download, uh, you'll be able to uh, get that first chapter of Unlocking Glory Amen. As, you, as a free gift uh, to you from us. Amen. If you haven't received your, your Unlocking Glory copy, we encourage you to get Unlocking Glory. It's an incredible tool for your spiritual toolbox to help you to learn how to hear God's voice. There is so much in this book that will help you on your spiritual journey. Uh, we've got uh, 50 facets of the apostolic ministry explained here. Uh, there's also the uh, deep study of the gifts of the spirit, uh, financial harvest and the blessings that God has uh, promised us from each type of giving. There's a chapter of women in the ministry that will encourage women to answer the, the call of God on your life. There's mm. just so much testimony and encouragement and, and unlucky glory. And every chapter is deep teaching. We we also have just published this study guide for unlocking glory. So together with this companion study guide, it'll really help you to uh, to self reflect yes. and understand where you are in your yielding process with the Lord, and it'll help you to grow even the more. Amen. So uh, e even questions that you don't even know you have are going to be answered as Absolutely. you are on this journey with God. So you can get this uh, unlocking glory and unlocking glory study guide at our website in the United States with free shipping at HightowerMinistry.org. And uh, if you'd like a signed copy, we'll be glad to do that for you as well. And outside of the United States, we suggest that you go to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or wherever you get your reading materials. Amen. We want to encourage you also to look us up 
on uh, Charisma Podcast Network. If you listen to podcasts, you can look us up at High Tower Ministries Podcast anywhere you listen to your podcast. We have uh, three messages that go out a week on Facebook. Follow us on Facebook. Yes. We have uh, three Greater Glory shows go out every week. Uh, great teaching. And then, of course, on testimony on Tuesday night is Testimony Tuesdays. And we have wonderful guests that come on and share. You just, you'll just learn and grow so much with High Tower Ministries. So get connect with us. Amen. So until next time, be blessed. Be blessed. Thank you for listening to the High Tower Ministries podcast. Our shows are broadcast each week on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. For more information about this ministry and to acquire our resource materials for spiritual growth, visit our website at www.hightowerministry.org. Look for High Tower Ministries on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Get connected with us. We would love to hear how the Lord is moving through this ministry and how the Word of God is impacting your life. Until next time, be blessed. And please don't forget to rate and review on Apple Podcast and subscribe wherever you listen so you don't miss a show.